David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Wednesday, December 8th, 2021. Time for another show, so we might as well get started on this one. Plenty going on. I already know what's going to happen. I already know. I already know what's going to happen in our segment with Greg. Greg Dworkin coming up very shortly. Uh, one, he told me. But before he told me, I had already guessed from the uh, in the morning post. I knew we would be talking procedure today. So I did everything I could to not get ready for it, just so that it would seem more natural and spontaneous, I guess. So here we go. But first, of course, our morning tweet from Bill in Portland, who says, The K-Girl in the Morning Radio Show is live now. This so much is true. Sean Hannity threw a, what? Threw a butt out of his office window. Well, okay, I see what you mean. And now the Fox News Christmas tree is ablaze. Uh, We know now which kind of butt we were talking about throwing out the window. Uh, Kegro X reports live as the smoke drifts down to Virginia and encircles his head like a wreath. It's very cool the way it's working. Yeah, I don't know if you saw that one this morning. I I don't know how you missed it, but uh, if if the video was in your feed while you were awake, you definitely saw it, because it's, uh, as I was saying, it's Melania's worst design yet. It looks, it kind of looks like something she might have designed for the White House Christmas display, where she's still in the White House, and thank God she's not. But, uh, yeah, it's one big outdoor tree and whatever. I don't know what, where the, the place is. Uh, I guess the Fox News studios outside of in, in New York, I guess. I don't know. You know, can you believe they're in New York City, by the way? Why aren't they in some place uh, rural in real America? I don't know. Anyway, their Christmas tree is on fire. It must mean something, but we don't know what. So we can spend the day interpreting the signs and find out what's going on. Let's see, other things happening this morning. Just, you know, happen to notice, uh, I mean, a routine gun story for the day. Uh, not even a gun fail story. I just happened to see it pointed out because, uh, of course... SFDB, who keeps an eye on gun activity for us these days, uh, picked up on the story. Just as the founders intended, this happened in uh, Pennsylvania, I guess in suburban Philly. So they didn't have suburban Philly back then. It was just Philly and farms around it, I guess. But anyway, founding, uh, you know, birthplace of our democracy, et cetera, et cetera. So might as well be engaged in this. Angry suburban Philly gunman killed Jeep driver in apparent road rage shooting. And uh, I guess mm, one of those rare road rage shootings where the guy who does the shooting isn't actually driving anywhere. He was apparently walking home the other day. Uh, uh, I mean, they got the uh, the photo of the guy here. So anyway, so uh, he was in Pottstown in Montgomery County, uh, I guess. And walking home... And a Jeep drove past him and nearly struck him, according to, well, according to the guy who just murdered everybody. So I don't know how much of his word we should take. on it. Almost ran him over. And it, I thought this part was interesting about it. He made him, it made him so angry, it says here, and that's in quotes, made him so angry that he went to his apartment, which of course is where he was going anyway, went to his apartment to try to, quote, cool down. Before getting his 9mm Taurus semi-automatic handgun and going back outside, Steele said. So this is not going to work out very well for him. And, of course, it doesn't work very well for the driver either. Uh, Apparently, uh, the guy must have, I mean, the guy must have had some idea of who he was. The story says they didn't know each other beforehand. But, I mean, if you almost get run over by a Jeep while you're walking on your way home and then you go to your apartment to cool down, what makes you think that the Jeep is still going to be there if he was in such a hurry driving somewhere he's probably long gone now but instead he heads back out with his gun now that he's cooled down good job on the cooling off period there by the way and uh, essentially uh, and the, the upshot of the story no, no pun intended there is that he murders the other guy and i mean it murders because uh, i'm sure that the the guy who did the shooting would be like well i i it's self-defense but you can't do the self-defense by almost being run over by a car getting back to your apartment, sitting down, allegedly to cool down, and then failing that task. 
pick up your gun and go out hunting for the guy. So he is charged with first degree murder. He found him. He shot him eight times. And now um, that's the upshot of it, right? I've, uh, I've That guy almost ruined my life by running me over. I'm going to ruin it now by murdering him. And his life ruined mine. I don't know whether they, you know, uh, does first degree murder carry the death penalty anywhere anymore? I don't know. We're sort of backing away from that. I know a lot of listeners are opposed to the death penalty. That would really be something, though, for the guy to end up, like, on death row. Well, they go, Look what happened. I almost got killed by this guy. And now I'm going to be killed by the state instead because I killed him. Guns save lives, everybody. There you go. Just as the NRA intended. I don't know. Kind of a depressing note for the day. Not something I would normally spend some time on. It's just... <sighs> I don't know. Feels like a rough day, a rough start to the day here. So uh, I thought I'd share it with you and maybe between us we can uh, bear the sorrow of it. Anyway, Greg Dworkin on his way in here, ready to roll. I know what uh, I know what's on his plate. I also know that there's another 25. Wow. Stories in the uh, or at least entries in the queue today. Sometimes those are the links and then comments on the story. Plus the obligatory uh, reminder that it is Wotan's Day. Good morning. Good Wotan's Day to you. Greg. And uh, bibbidi bobbidi boo to you, too. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, look, there it is. Yeah, it oh, actually yeah. already it, says it in actually, it. It's like a well, script. I, mean, I wrote David that I was going to uh, talk to him about this. Now, and as an aside, you know, yesterday, not yesterday, but Monday, uh, last time I did the show, uh, toward the end of the segment, I was saying to you, you know, sometimes I worry a little bit about the fact that maybe I won't have enough material. And then <laughs> by the end of it, I always feel that way. There is yeah. way more material. I can't fit this in. Th- then I have time to fit in. Right. So. And I said to myself, so you know, I really have to stop worrying about it. This is like when, you know, in the old days, the times before, if we would have breakfast together, I never mm-hmm. got up and said, well, I'm not having breakfast with David because maybe I don't have enough material. <laughs> right. Just, just meet him, start talking to him. You may not and, get to eat. you know, stuff happens. It happens. I will, yeah, comment on the toast if I have to. Yeah. So Political Huddle uh, yes, had this that? piece, uh, part of what I had sent David beforehand. Congress waves its procedural magic wand. Ah. Because these are the kinds of things I need explanations for. I didn't know for. what kind of wave we were talking about, but okay. They wave the magic wand to waive the requirements of. Yes, and right. it's actually under the subheading bibbidi bobbidi boo. Don't unusual. let your eyes glaze over at the mention of procedural gymnastics. Why now we're you? jumping from magic to gymnastics. The move takes aim. Well, maybe we should do Magic Johnson because he like combines everything here. <laughs> the move takes aim at that tricky 60 vote threshold in the Senate for a one time only exemption mm-hmm. to allow Democrats to raise the debt ceiling with a simple majority. Uh, yes. OK, well, you have to move the bill that provides well, the exception and get 60 votes to make it so that you can get 51 votes. In other words. Mm-hmm. Yes. Believe it or not. So, so you need 10 Republicans to say, yes, we'll allow a 51 vote uh, majority on this particular bill so that we can all vote against it. So we'll yeah. vote for that so that we could vote against it. Yep. I, I'm, I'm trying to keep up here. I just want to make sure I understand this. That's it. I mean, I, that's really it. I know a lot of people were very uh, shocked by this and it, it, it's, there, it's got a lot of layers to it. If you try and analyze what's going on, but the basics of it are, are just that they passed a, uh, well, they, they've passed legislation to create a uh, statutory, I guess. Uh, what they've done is they really used the same mechanism that they used that, that keeps reconciliation and the budget uh, filibuster proof that there is a statutory time limit on debate. So they decided for this one thing, they would establish a time limit for the debate of a debt ceiling hike measure in the Senate. But yes, in order to Gotta pass be done before that mid January. Yeah, but yeah, in order to pass that new one-time exemption, that bill was subject to a filibuster, and Republicans could have filibustered it. So, for I guess for one thing, for people who are saying, well, why don't they just now create a one-time exception for the voting rights bill or something else? Well, you still have to get Republicans to agree not to filibuster the legislation creating the one-time exemption and they did this this time precisely because of what you said they want to be on record voting against a debt ceiling increase but are in fact afraid of causing a default and melting down the entire global economic system 
So they actually decided, we'll let this go. We will not filibuster. We won't not filibuster the debt ceiling increase. Someone will do that. And we won't be able to find 10 Republicans to say, no, you shouldn't do that. But instead, we can find 10 Republicans who can say, I will allow this one time Democrats to muster the votes all by themselves and for us to all be able to vote against it, but still not cause the crisis. That's how far out of their way they'll go to avoid the default, but they can't find their way to just actually addressing the problem head on and saying, as much as I would like to oppose it, it's too dangerous. So, so in case you're wondering uh, about them, you know, ridding themselves of Trump at any point, uh, no, that won't happen either. So uh, Jamie Dupre writes, in other words, there'll be no debt limit default crisis just before Christmas in Congress, or as my father might say, the fix is in. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Or, and I guess the, their intention is then to vote all 50 of them against it and then call in the vice president to break the tie. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. they're talking about 51 vote mm -hmm. uh, to pass. Yeah. And we'll see what Manchin does. Uh, yeah. Well, it's weird, but I guess it's best that, you know. So according to another piece in the gossip rag, uh, Politico, ah. McConnell secures GOP support for new debt strategy. Senate leaders seem to have found a path forward to avoid a debt cliff without Republican votes. I mean, except so it does require So the thing them. is, which I don't fully understand here. Uh, John, the way John Cornyn puts it is, I'm going to support Democrats raising the debt ceiling without Republican votes. To have Democrats <laughs> raise the debt ceiling and be held accountable for racking up the debt is my goal. This helps us accomplish it. So basically, they will never raise the debt ceiling. So Democrats want to get rid of the debt ceiling, and Republicans will say, well, we'll never let you do that because we want to keep holding you to the fact that you keep raising the debt ceiling. Hmm. And, uh, you know, with this mechanism of, but in this one case, we'll allow you to do it, hmm. you know, yes. just uh, the first thing that occurred to me is, why don't the Democrats try to pass a Voting Rights Act but before they do so, they pass another piece of legislation saying that just this one time mm -hmm. for uh, 15 minutes, whenever you vote no, it's really yes. <laughs> you could try that. But yeah, no, if, it's if subject... that passed, would it work? <laughs> no. Well, it w if it passed, yes, I guess it would. And, and then people say politics is stupid. I don't know why they say that. Yes. Well, uh, the thing is that one, uh, presumably that one wouldn't pass. They, they wouldn't have the Republicans say. But if it did, you could do that. I yeah, mean, the whole well, point sure, is you could do whatever did, you no. want as long as you say that, okay, but in this particular case, we have a majority. Yes. You Well, largely. Or a yeah. filibuster-proof majority, depending right. upon what the issue is. The, the, uh, yeah, the, but the, you can put it into the reconciliation because this particular thing doesn't pass muster in reconciliation. Uh, that thing doesn't. But this would, the debt ceiling would. They could put it in reconciliation. They just won't. I don't know why. Mm. Uh, but now they're doing this stupid thing. Now, note uh, John Cornyn's framing of it. And note also how we usually talk about things like filibuster votes and cloture votes and procedural votes. Uh, when they want to hide from them, you know, they say, oh, well, it was merely a procedural vote. It wasn't the actual substance of things. Um, when they don't want to hide from it, they say, oh, you know, you can't just separate out procedure. Procedure is a substantive outcome in the Senate. So what they're doing here is Cornyn's preferred framing is I'm voting for a measure that forces Democrats to raise the debt ceiling all by themselves. So therefore, all blame for the debt ceiling going up lies with Democrats. But, you know, the first part of the sentence is the interesting part. I'm voting for. Uh, yeah. OK. That thing right there, John, you're voting. Yes for raising the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling won't be raised unless you vote yes on this measure and you're voting yes, you're on record. You've done it. You've raised it. Right, and, and keep that in mind because it's uh, for something else we're going to wind up talking about. Yeah. No but one will this political piece goes back and says Republicans can tout a key concession mm. ah, that they're really? holding Democrats in this process mm -hmm. to a number rather than a time. That is to say... They'll agree to it as long as the Democrats agree that they're raising the debt ceiling to some specific amount. Mm -hmm. They're not agreeing to say we suspend the debt limit until uh, midterms. Okay. Or abolishing it, I guess, probably. Or also. abolishing it. Well, they won't abolish it because they're on record as saying they want to use it as a tool yes. to either obstruct if they're in the minority or blame Democrats. Mm-hmm. 
if they possibly can. Yes. So uh, they would like to always vote no, even though they want it to be yes, because they want to be on record as voting no. Mm-hmm. All right. Democrats are saying just pass the damn thing so that like the country doesn't fall apart. I guess so. And so they're, you're talking about the uneven playing field that the Democrats and Republicans always have when it comes to Congress. Yes, that's true. And uh, well, worth observing. Uh, now, uh, no Politico one else also observe observes. You. It's yes. a critical moment for the GOP leader who comes under incessant attack from former President Donald Trump for his maneuvering as minority leader in the 50-50 Senate. His members panned, tying a debt ceiling to the National Defense Authorization Act. And some aren't ready to go along with his latest play. Mm-hmm. All right. So it's not a done deal, but uh, McConnell's confident. Uh, yeah. All right. I mean, it still has to pass the Senate. The House passed the thing last night, I think. Right. And uh, yeah, well, I'm going to take a look at this. I, I have some of the legislative language in front of me. I'll have to scan over it. I mean... I don't know why. Quite honestly, this is so convoluted that you might as well try this, although there will be no Democrats willing to do it. I say pass the thing in the Senate and then take up the debt ceiling bill and then offer an amendment to abolish the debt ceiling. And, and they won't do that. Yeah, and, well, they'll uh, say it's no. It's so complicated I mean, that I had to ask David about it. But, you know, it doesn't matter. That's, that's a time my, you know, how complicated thing. is it? That's my threshold. You need yeah. threshold to decide things, whether oh. it's good or bad or up or down or stuff like that. Is it complicated or is it uh, just straightforward? Well, it's complicated. How do you know? How do you ask David? I didn't get it. <laughs> well, no, it's straightforward. I just told you what happens. No. Yeah, yeah well, no, it doesn't it. work that way. Okay. So while all this is going on, yes, with Trump getting some uh, flack and expecting uh, to give flack to people flack. like McConnell about uh, you know just having the country go to hell because it's good for politics. Yes. Okay. Uh, the pundit roundup today that I put together. Oh, I have to look. Yes. <clears throat> you can't tell you're feuding Republicans without a scorecard. And I have a list. <laughs> it isn't just one. It's a list. You need a, a full card. It's... You need a full scorecard. All right. Let's... Can't tell the players without a scorecard. Okay. Right. Ron Filipowski starts us off. Wowie. Dan Crenshaw trashes Freedom Caucus oh, members yeah. Green, Brooks, Gomert, Kosar, Jordan as performance artists while defending Adam Kinziger. Okay. We have grifters in our midst, he says. Lie after lie after lie. Hmm. Dan Crenshaw. Yeah. Well, this I is mean, happening. He is one, too. But Elaine yes. Godfrey. Well, yes, that's part of the point. Uh, Elaine Godfrey from The Atlantic, the Republican congressman taking on Lauren Boebert. That would be Nancy Mace. Oh, yeah, right. Why is a South Carolina Lauren Republican Boebert. policing her party's far right flank? Here are three possibilities. Okay. I thought she was in with... Marjorie Taylor Greene, but I guess that means they're no, no, fighting, fighting over it, too. They're fighting over abortion and oh, how right, right, right. pro and anti-abortion yes. they are and this, that, and everything else. And yes, some possibilities include things like Nancy Mace really believes that uh, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and people like that are, are uh, you know, a threat. Yes. That's not really it. Oh, well, I mean, they are, but that's not what she believes. Right. Uh, something else could also be at work here. Uh, Lane Godfrey writes, Mace, Nancy Mace, is charismatic, smart, and ambitious, and it might be disheartening for her to be constantly overshadowed by colleagues who traffic in <laughs> racism and conspiracy theories about Jewish space lasers. Yes. It must be exhausting having to fight for attention while people like Bobert and Marjorie Taylor Greene become the new faces of the American right. right. Getting involved in this beef, or any beef, is perhaps the best mm, way for beef. Nancy Mace and, uh, yeah. I would add, uh, you know, Dan Crenshaw. Right. True. To get her name out there. Conflict yes. makes for good stories that attracts the attention of TV producers and Atlantic editors like me. <laughs> Throwing yeah. punches is a good way for a neglected politician to get ahead. Mace would be far from the first politician who have recognized this. There you have it. Punch people, everybody. That's right. the so idea. it's not like she's all of a sudden seen the light and now has caught on to what's going on. Hmm. It's like, oh, well, you know, just being like a normal right winger isn't enough. Yeah. I'm I mean, in a way, she has seen the light. Yeah, it's not, but it's not. She hasn't seen the moral light that says, "Distance yourself from these people and uh, uh, um, uh, ostracize them from mainstream society." She's saying, "Oh, uh, performance art is the way to get your name out there." So, I mean, a performance art of their sort, I'm uncomfortable with. But there is a performance that I can put on that I'm comfortable with, which is fighting on Twitter with these two. 
Right. So, now, there's right. the extremes, of course, of the Republican Party. On the one hand, Tim Alberta has a very well-researched piece on Peter Meyer. Hmm. He voted to impeach Kenny, survived the GOP, the part that I thought was interesting from the article that I'll talk about on the show. It's very long. The entire day, the vote, as much as the attack, this is January 6th, mm -hmm. had caught Meyer unprepared. His party's leadership had provided no guidance to its members, leaving everyone to navigate a squall of rumor and disinformation in one-man lifeboats. Squall. The next week, when Democrats introduced an article of impeachment and promptly scheduled a vote seeking to hold President Donald Trump accountable for inciting the mob siege at the Capitol, Duh. Meyer steeled himself for some tough conversations within his party. But these conversations never happened. Most of Trump's staunchest defenders were too shell-shocked to defend him, even behind closed doors, and the Republican leadership was AWOL. There was no whipping efforts, no strategy sessions, no lectures on procedure, no lectures on policy. Barreling toward one of the most consequential votes in modern history, everybody was on their own. So talk about procedure and how McConnell is trying to figure out things where Republicans can vote yes but mean no or no but mean yes or however they want to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, on January 6th, when all of this was happening, uh, uh, Kevin McCarthy was basically pooping in his pants. Yes. And, and was absolutely, and other you know, pants. talk about leadership, absolutely missing. Yes. Which is one of the reasons why we, uh, Democrats and, and people like Pelosi are just so angry with him. Yeah. Well, he's a terrible, terrible person. He is. And when we say that, this is what we're talking about here. So Meyer voted as conscious and now, of course, is being attacked by the rest of the party. So that's one poll of the party. The other is the uh, more than just performative. Uh, uh, this is a piece uh, by Greg Jar Sargent highlighting. Steve mm -hmm. Bannon is now ripping into David Perdue. You know, there's the theme here mm -hmm. of uh, Republicans attacking each other, Republicans in disarray. Steve happening? Bannon is now ripping into David Perdue, who is Trump's candidate for Georgia governor, as too much of a squish to wage the war on democracy that Bannon wants. Squish. Squish game. Yes. Yeah. So basically, uh, you know, this fits in with Barton Gelman's uh, The Trump Insurgency for mm. uh, 2024 has already started. Uh, you know, it Bannon, has. of course, is under indictment and the January 6th is. committee is moving along. And I have more on that as well. Yes. But uh, David Perdue. Is just a weird Trump surrogate mm -hmm. yeah. in in Georgia. You know, okay. they're trying to play the uh, Youngkin card and have somebody who doesn't <laughs> yeah, look okay. all of that threatening, nonetheless, be all that threatening. But it doesn't quite work that way because Youngkin successfully avoided talking about it altogether. And Purdue can't. And Purdue can't for a variety of reasons. Hmm. One of them is that he's going to be running against Stacey Abrams should he get the nomination. And Abrams right. is already living in his head because this announcement was all about how we have to stop Stacey Abrams and communists and nothing about what he actually wants to do for himself. <laughs> and while he's doing oh, that, yeah. he's being attacked on his right flank by mm -hmm. Brian Kemp and his writer flank by Steve Bannon. OK. And, and so it's a bizarre situation, uh, which is really going to be uh, uh, you know important to watch and, and play out. And uh, whichever one of those factions win, they're going to have a completely disorganized and uh, torn apart party in Georgia. Yes. Which, All right. You know, well, good. Should help uh, Reverend Warnock and uh, other Democrats there. So mm -hmm. just an interesting uh, thing. It's not just the Democrats that are in disarray. Now, does that mean that uh, Trump and those folks who are perfectly willing to take on David Perdue are also willing to take on uh, uh, Mitch McConnell? And just start attacking Republicans for being too squishy because here they are voting with Democrats by voting no, but meaning yes. Hmm. Yes. Many such crazy things happening these days. All right. right. Okay. So uh, uh, our friend John Storr at the editorial board writes, this is in the uh, Pundit Roundup, the midterms are going to be decided by swing voters who can't or won't figure out for themselves that the GOP is knowingly killing GOP voters with this pandemic. For the purpose of prolonging the pandemic in order to blame the damage done on Democrats. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's up to Democrats to make that a little bit more clear, a little bit more specific. And, uh, you know, with the debt ceiling, that's exactly what they need to do. Uh, and, you know, look, if Republicans are saying to the Democrats, we're going to posture and make you the responsible party, Democrats have to own it and be the responsible party and say, OK, we'll be the grownups. Here's what grownups do. And we love it. We embrace it. We're not running away from it. And the thing is, the Republicans are actively telling you they're not interested. Hmm. So that leaves us. That's us. Okay. Wow. 
I don't know. I, uh, oh, I, I've been interrupted by uh, uh, a, a bit of breaking. I'll save it for later. Go on. I'm sorry. What? I interrupted by oh. uh, me all the time. Oh, so yes. I, oh, well, this is just of local interest to me. I uh, just happened to see the news, and, and it connects to another piece of news from uh, yesterday as well, about Loudoun County, where I still am located. Despite it all, as you mm-hmm. may recall, you were all told by the national news media that Loudoun County is, in fact, the new bastion of right-wing backlash. Uh, and was responsible for swinging the election to Yunkin, except, of course, Yunkin lost by 11 points in Loudoun County, which I told you at the time, so maybe you won't be surprised to learn, one, the thing that just interrupted my morning, uh, the announcement that Loudoun County's employees have just won collective bargaining rights for themselves, and that accompanies uh, news from yesterday that they are removing the names of Confederates and segregationists from the major highways that run through Loudoun County by a uh, lopsided eight to nothing vote of the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors. So for all of you who may still, despite my entreaties, have come away with the impression that Loudoun County was in fact that bastion of right-wing backlash, it's still way blue and staying that way and making policy as though... The election had never happened. Hmm. So there you go. Just thought I would so, interrupt uh, with that. Let's see. Uh, we are going. And I almost. I took us almost to the music of the break, so we can preview what we'll do after my interruption of you. Yeah, uh, uh, Virginia's uh, sixty-six point one percent fully vaccinated, meaning two doses. I'm going to oh, see yes. if I can find Loudon to see where they are. Okay. Yeah, you'll find that uh, it is the the blue bastion that I told you it was, and not at all the way it was portrayed on the news. Surprised everyone, so you have to tune into this show. That, that's my surrogate for uh, blue and red. Yeah. Okay. Well, check that out. We'll be back in two minutes and make that announcement. I look forward to finding out how my neighbors are doing. Hi, I'm Scott Anderson, the guy that writes the daily summary for this show, k in the Morning. Thank you to everyone that supports this show. Many of you send donations through PayPal, Patreon, Square Cash, Radio Public, and so on. Some of you write your own essays and send them in, or read articles with your own commentary. We appreciate it. Now, some of you are listening to this and thinking, I'd like to help, but isn't there something I could do that wouldn't require money or effort? Why, yes, there is. You can just like us. On Daily Coast, they call it the recommend button. YouTube has a thumbs up. There are hearts and likes and love buttons. Tap our love button. Tap our love button every day. Share our shows and summaries on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and iTunes, Stitcher and Amazon. Most of these places allow you to write a review, so a sentence or two would be great. Recommend us to social media or tell your friends to listen to the show. You aren't just helping us, you're helping them find their new favorite thing to listen to. You could change the world. So thank you in advance for me and everybody else in the world. Welcome back now to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Netflix Radio. Uh, my time interrupting Greg is, is over. <laughs> no more of that. Uh, yeah, that's what you think. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see how this goes. Uh, well, uh, but we you're we interrupting left... me to really make the see? point that I'm interrupting you because right. that's what the legis. But that's only true through <laughs> mid-January. Just one time you're There's allowed time to do only. this with 51 votes. Yeah. All right. So we're uh, the Loudoun County as I'm we I'm looking at the exited. Democrat yes. and Chronicle. Oh, what is that? I don't even know. I don't is know. That Maybe do it's I own a paper. It? But what it has is a Loudoun County, Virginia COVID-19 vaccine tracker. Ah, and whereas 66% yeah, okay. of Virginia is vaccinated with two shots, people fully vaccinated in Loudoun County is 90.4%. Damn. People vaccinated with at least one dose is 99.34% if you're eligible. Okay. So uh, Loudoun County is pretty blue because that's a pretty good surrogate of red-blue these days. And in fact, uh, there's a whole article about how the largest counties like uh, uh, in uh, Maryland – Mm. Uh, for example, uh, you know, your Fairfield County, stuff like that. The largest counties uh, are doing really well against uh, COVID so far, which is important because with this Omicron stuff shifting into gear, uh, you know, it's uh, important that you get your third shot. There's actually some breaking news on that oh, all right. uh, because uh, I think it was Pfizer that was announcing that they have evidence that a booster really helps to get your uh protection levels against Omicron back up to what was seen with the previous variants with two shots alone. Oh. So getting your, your booster is a big help. 
there is some conflicting information remaining about just how severe Omicron is, and that's not to be uh, uh, surprised at. Uh, we told you when Kai uh, uh, Coopersmith said, uh, you know, last week, uncertainty is the name of the game when things start, so people have to embrace and understand we're going to be uncertain about a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Bob Wachter uh, from University of San Francisco says the argument is to require three shots to be deemed fully vaccinated. Deemed. Demon even, pest. Oh, yeah. The arguments to require three shots to be deemed fully vaccinated are now compelling. Let's get it done before Omicron mm-hmm. washes ashore in a major way. Counting on lower severity to be our savior is a foolish risk to take. And Ashish Jha points out, with early data rolling in, here's what we currently stand with Omicron. First of all, we have plenty of evidence that Omicron will spread easily, quickly, and far. That's what's happening in South Africa. And their hospitalizations are starting to go up. We should expect globally relatively large waves. How will people fare? It depends upon who you are. Who I am? All right. That's that's part of the uncertainty. There's three groups of people, he says. The immunologically naive. Mm -hmm. You don't fall in that category. You're very sophisticated when it comes to immunology. Then uh, somewhat protected. And those are people perhaps who had only one shot or maybe they just got infected and never got their uh, jab at all. Hmm. Uh And then there's the highly protected. And that would be people who, uh, I don't know, got infected and then got nine boosters. Oh, can you? I don't know, I guess. All right. But yeah, if they got shots (coughs) plus uh, infection and recovery, then they're in much better shape. So let's talk about each of them. So group one, immunologically naive. Who are they? Unvaccinated, not recently infected. Remember, just as with the vaccines, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, after six months starting to wane, probably... Uh, recently infected means uh, within six months, because after six months, uh, that probably wins right. too. Yeah. Hmm. How how will they fare? They're likely to get infected with Omicron. Uh, Many yeah. of them will get sick. Yeah. Maybe we, Jim Jordan. We don't know. Yeah. Maybe Jim Jordan. We don't know how it's going to affect them. So that's the uncertainty part. Mm-hmm. Group two, somewhat protected. Who are they? Folks with one or two shots of a vaccine or a recent infection, meaning within six months, how will they fare? Large numbers will see breakthrough infections. Severe illness should be largely preventable. High-risk folks in the group will still get very sick. Okay. Okay. Well, and then group three, highly protected. I Who are they? Mean. You and me. Hey. Folks boosted or have hybrid immunity, which is infection plus two shots. How will they fare? High degree of protection. Some breakthrough. Probably not very severe illness. It'll okay. look like mild disease. All right. So when you hear Omicron, it's no big deal, and it looks mild. Well, that's true for some, but not for others. Yes. And that's why it's critical to get the first and second shots and the boosters for as many people as possible in the window that we have. Hmm. And Michael Mina, who tracks testing, uh, I don't have his uh, uh, quotes in front of me, was saying things along the lines of, look, uh, the number of cases in the U.S. is starting to rise again. And we're taking the same approach that we took two years ago and last year, which is always wrong, Mm -hmm. which is let's wait and see what happens. You can't wait and see what happens. You have to be proactive if you're trying to decrease the effects of these things that come. And so assuming it's going to be mild, is really bad policy. Okay. And there's things you could do. And uh, one of the things you could do is increase testing, send free test kits to everybody, send masks to everybody, send surgical masks. Uh, uh, to every household. There's no reason why you can't, but we haven't. Mm-hmm. And we've had two years to get this done. And I don't know why. I don't know. Maybe it's all the people going on television to say, don't worry about it. Don't do yeah, anything. exactly. Which is really not good. So um, let me tell you about something that was written back in September of 2021, a Lancet article, medical mm-hmm. journal. Yes, right. Okay. I remember them. Uncoupling vaccination from politics, a call to action. (laughs) Do that. There you go. Right. We recommend five short term steps. First, diversify the messengers. Public officials should recognize that when promoting vaccination, the messengers is important as the message. Promotion efforts will be most effective when communicated from an array of trusted speakers and perspectives. It'd be really helpful if people like Aaron Rodgers would get the vaccine on TV. Oh, well. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Second, draw on broad expertise as COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy is not just a public health problem. Public officials need to convene experts from social, behavioral, and communication sciences. Fancy that. 
Mm-hmm. Talk about having the uh, uh, anthropologists and the sociologists oh, wow. and the communications people, not just the scientists trying to craft the message. I think you need celebrities. That too. Okay. Oh, uh, right. Third, invest in the research. Okay, oh, I think we're I doing think that. that. Was three. All right. But here are the fourth and fifth of the most interesting pieces here. Fourth, counter purveyors of misinformation. Policymakers and professional organizations should examine available legal, regulatory, and private sector options, and I have a story on this, huh. to reduce the impact of well financed organizations spreading misinformation. Mm, all right. I think, I think, uh, one of the well-financed uh, organizations spreading misinformation, by the way, is uh, the Tennessee legislature, but we'll get to that. Uh, the the U.S. So government should solicit the expertise of agencies outside the health sector, including Homeland Security, Commerce, Justice, oh. and State. I thought it was going to be celebrities. All right. Well, no, it's like looking at climate change as a military issue. Uh, okay, sure. Cross, uh, cross or breaking cross down those silos. There. there we go. Yeah. That's the one. Silos. Silos. And fifth, stop the misinformation. Conservative media outlets must stop amplifying falsehoods. Advertisers should pull funding from programs and websites that promote misinformation as they put the lives of Americans and the health of our economy at risk. Social media platforms should enhance efforts to track, disclose, and stop the spread of misinformation. Yes, stop it. That all sounds good, right? Yeah. Okay. Published 6.08 p.m. December 7th, 2021 Mm -hmm. in the Tennessean is this headline. COVID-19 Medical Board Deletes Anti-Misinformation Policy of Mid-GOP Pressure. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. (laughs) Representative John Reagan threatened to dissolve the Board of Medical Examiners if they didn't remove a policy. Like Steve Bannon dissolved? Like an acid? Yeah. Uh, He'd remove the board if they didn't remove a policy. Yeah, which was unanimously exactly. unanimously adopted by the Board of Medical Examiners uh, examiners in September, like that establishes that doctors who spread demonstrably true, untrue information, untrue yeah. information about COVID-19 vaccines. So excited about this. I can't even read. Establishes mm-hmm. that doctors who spread demonstrably untrue information about COVID-19 vaccines yeah. could have their licenses suspended wow. or potentially revoked. I'm finally going to get Scott DeJarlet. Right. It was unanimously adopted by the Board of Medical Examiners <laughs> so, in Tennessee disarray, in September. That's what you're saying. Yes. That you lose your license if you lie about COVID and vaccines. Okay. However, under pressure from Representative Reagan, Reagan, R A G A N, Reagan, mm-hmm. John Reagan, under pressure, members <laughs> voted seven to three to delete the statement from their website, but not rescind the policy. <laughs> That's a compromise for you. Yeah. You'll lose three-fifths of your license, just to borrow from the compromises in our American history. Right. So huh. just you think, just that you think uh, the House and Senate are the only stupid organizations that My play God. with uh, procedure here. The deletion was spurred by Representative John Reagan, <laughs> Republican Oak Ridge, a co-chair of the Joint the Government Ridge Operations Boys. Committee, who insisted board members don't have the authority to create a new disciplinary offense without the approval of lawmakers. Hmm. Over the past two months, Reagan sent at least three letters pressuring the board to delete the policy or appear before the committee to explain itself. And he made a threat to dissolve the board in behind-the-scenes discussions with the Department of Health, hmm. according to a letter from a department attorney obtained by the Tennessee. Why do these public health people keep resigning in the states? I don't yeah, get it. Yeah, right. Uh, I, that's an interesting compromise that they came up with and says, I wonder if that one will work, uh, although I, I, I have – I do wonder whether then people that they suspend will say, I didn't know that was the policy. You can't suspend me without warning me. Well, we used to warn you, but the Tennessee legislature said to stop warning you. But yeah, oh, that would have been interesting. And I don't, it's hard to tell with a Republican legislature whether you would have been able to garner a majority vote to dissolve a, a health policy board in the middle of a pandemic. I well, think Jennifer they Putnam, an attorney who works with the board, warned board members that Reagan conveyed his displeasure with the misinformation policy in the strongest terms. Chairman <laughs> Reagan well, also made clear terms. he has no qualms about moving forward with dissolving the board and reconstituting it with new members. Well, I'm sure. He Remember, he could just turn around and say, I know it's a pandemic. That's why I'm putting all of these anti-vaxxers uh, on the board right now. It's really important that we have new blood. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the issue is I don't think he could do it by himself. He would need Well, he has, in votes, fact, done this with might, another state agency, so it's not a hollow votes. threat, said Putnam. Okay. 
Yeah, well, I don't know. I might have made him do it. But I suppose if he's going to abide by that as, and say it's okay if you have the policy just so long as you don't put it on the website, then I guess I would take that. Right. Maybe. Now, here's the talk about compromise. And and this is uh, uh, John Cornyn. I'd give him ex- COVID. Explaining that. what's happening in Tennessee. Oh, okay. Functionally, anyway. All right. Reagan said Tuesday that deleting the policy from the board's website had functionally the same impact as rescinding it, but the board members said it did not. There you go. Right. So there you have it. There's your compromise. Yeah. And I I think it might actually turn on something like that. It might be that Reagan believes that anybody who challenged their loss of their license would be able to get it back based on the policy not being published on the website. He may know something, but... I don't know. Board President Dr. Melanie Blake opened the meeting by stating misinformation about COVID-19 vaccines had cost lives, health, jobs and other incalculable losses in our society. When asked specifically by another board member, if the board was voting to rescind the policy or remove it from a website, Blake confirmed it was the latter. Mm -hmm. So she thinks. So she's taking it off the website, but not rescinding the policy. Yeah. Now. This drew concern from Grant Mullins, another Department of Health attorney, who said he believed there was no precedent for the board maintaining a policy that was not published anywhere. Right. That's, yeah. He recommended the board conduct a second vote on whether to rescind the policy outright or adjust the website to match, and board members declined Mm. to take that step. (laughs) Okay. Now, uh, this comes, uh, and I was writing on Twitter uh, the other day about people not appreciating in places like Florida, Texas, Mm -hmm. even New York, uh, under Cuomo, how much pressure public health and hospital organizations were yes. to conform to what the governor considered to ah, be right, the uh, uh, the popular uh, uh, you know bottom line, yeah, what the party line was, and uh, given the fact that the governors have so much influence on how money was spent, mm-hmm. you would simply not see from anywhere in the health or public health sector, anybody disagreeing with the governor. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, well, it won't now in most of those states. And look at Tennessee. I mean, it's not even just the hospitals and the public health people directly. Now it's the medical profession and their uh, licensing boards. Yeah, like that should be up to them, right? Like a good uh, libertarian would say uh, licensing needs to be left up to the or as Rand who, Paul would right. say, licensing needs <laughs> right, to be left up to too. me because I'll just make my own board. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could always do that. Uh, that's interesting. What does the uh, – well, I suppose they should uh, – we know what Reagan, that Reagan, would say about it. It would be interesting for them to just play those games. And say, I, I would put the policy back on there today. Yeah, so would and, I. But, and you say know, um, – We're not Tennessee. Right. And they would say, well, I thought you guys agreed to take that off or we would dissolve you. Oh, yeah, we did. We did. We took it off. So I mean, what we'll put was it back, happening, but I the misinformation policy adopted in September aligned the official position of the board with the stance of the Federation of State Medical Boards. Mm-hmm. The entire policy was little more than one paragraph establishing doctors have an ethical and professional responsibility to share factual, scientifically grounded information and could face consequences if they did not. Yes. Now, I think that, you know, despite the tendency to never uh, – contradict your politicians i think that they should go on the offensive and start you know uh, uh advertising that joe reagan is trying to interfere with this and this is what he did mm-hmm. and behind the scenes he was telling us we better listen to what he's saying or he'll dissolve us yes. and everybody in tennessee needs to know this and it can't be behind the scenes yeah they should do that uh and the federation of state medical boards should threaten to decertify tennessee's medical board If that's a thing that they have over them at all. Um, Right. And if they have a medical school, they should, uh, you know, if the medical school doesn't go along with this and agree that this is bad, then, uh, you know, everything should should be on the table for decertification. Right. Now, let me guess is, I mean, we don't know if we have this information, but is is John Reagan not a doctor? I don't know. I would like to find out. That would be interesting to know. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that's right. They should threaten to do that and threaten to, uh, uh, pull the accreditation of, uh, Tennessee, uh, medical schools, right? And well, say, well here's where they draw the line. And, do this. and again, you know, I bring this up because of what happened in Virginia with the, uh, ICU doc, uh, mm-hmm. having his, uh, privileges suspended for, uh, pushing, uh, unproven therapies Yeah. and, uh, accusing the, uh, uh, the people who were uh, uh, against him 
mm-hmm. as being part of a conspiracy to kill people. Yeah. Well, I mean, you just can't go around doing do that. that. So one of the board members, you Dr. Debbie Christensen, at the September meeting said, I don't know that we can police opinion, even though it's wrong and even though it's causing obviously causing major problems. But we can tell people they can't say things that are absolutely false. OK, I think you can. So, uh, you know, they cannot say things that are absolutely that, you know, you should put in your policy. What you can't do is you can't say things that are absolutely false. Yeah, uh, that's a nice comp- uh, compromise there as well. I think so. So the new policy quickly ran afoul of Tennessee's Republican supermajority. During special session in October, lawmakers introduced at least three bills prohibiting the board from disciplining doctors for how they treat or what they say about coronavirus. One bill, which died in committee, required the governor to fire any board member who violated the prohibition. Hmm. They're really you know, trying hard. So right? How is medicine, it that the, you know, the governors can put pressure on these people? Well, this is how. Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, that is pretty interesting. Well, now, now I guess there's time to it's time to put pressure on Tennessee from the federal level, not only the the Federation of State Medical Boards, but I suppose I, mean, I don't know. Does, does is it a problem at uh, HHS that we're paying for medicine through Medicare and Medicaid in Tennessee? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of tools that could be used that uh, you know. Let's just say the other party wouldn't hesitate to use. Yeah. Some of these restrictions were eventually folded into a COVID-19 omnibus bill passed by lawmakers on October 30th and signed into law by Governor Bill Lee on November 12th, in case you couldn't remember who the governor of Tennessee is. Yeah, what's his last name? Lee. What? <laughs> Who's on first? The Billy. Lees of Billy, Virginia. Billy who? Now live in Tennessee. Yeah. The new law specifically says that any disciplinary process implemented by a health-related board regarding the dispensing or prescribing a medication for COVID-19 uh-huh. must be created as a government rule which is a process that requires review and approval by Reagan's committee. Yeah, right. So okay. what happened in Virginia hmm. is that this guy got into trouble for dispensing or prescribing medication for COVID-19 that uh, didn't have any proof that it worked. Ooh. And that got a foul of regulatory uh, we know uh, folks. Yeah. And in Tennessee, they're saying, well, but you can't do anything about it unless uh, the government mm-hmm. – passes a rule that says that you can. Yeah, sure. So we'll be the arbiters of whether or not that's a good idea or not. Good. Now, Virginia's not Tennessee. I can't see that happening in Virginia. Right. But it's just a reminder that when you're thinking about what happens to individual physicians, for example. Yes. Who may or may not be COVID cranks. Right. Okay. It really depends on what state you're talking about. It does. And that's bad news. And And if you're getting cover from the legislature, that partly explains why, you know, you can get away with stuff in one state that you cannot get away with in another. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's going to be problematic, and uh, there are a lot of tools to challenge that with, and I hope people will actually get on the ball and, and do it, because in the meantime, uh, you know, just as we've seen it with, uh, you know, in, in reproductive health care, we're finding out that women will face diverse challenges, let's say, depending on what state they live in, and now dealing with covid <laughs> You're going to fit. You already were facing diverse challenges for other reasons, but now it'll be questionable whether you can get medical treatment or whether the treatment you're getting is medical for that matter. But it's approved by the state legislature. So now the rule, you know, so here's where it gets interesting. uh And and remember what we said about having different messengers, making sure that it's not all the same thing. It isn't just people from uh, Kegro in the morning telling Tennessee what to do. Uh, it is. Apparently yeah. not all lawmakers agree. Senator Richard Briggs, Republican Knoxville, who is a doctor. Disarray. And the only Republican senator who voted against the omnibus bill, <laughs> said last week he objected to lawmakers inserting themselves into the board's efforts yes. to combat misinformation. Doctors have a responsibility to be a, quote, reliable source of mm-hmm. information, unquote, mm-hmm. Briggs said. And the board is tasked withholding those same doctors accountable. Yes. The Government okay. Operations Committee should not be telling the Board of Medical Examiners who are charged with protecting the public health and safety that they can't do something to a doctor that's intentionally giving known misinformation. Mm-hmm. This is the second time in eight months the Tennessee lawmakers have invoked the possibility of dissolving an entire government entity. In June, during a contentious meeting of the same committee, Several Republican lawmakers chastised the Department of Health for recommending COVID-19 vaccine to teenagers and discussed dissolving the agency if this vaccine advocacy didn't end. Hmm. You may remember that. I sort of vaguely remember that. Yeah, Tennessee now is no longer allowed to advocate for vaccines. 
They, yeah, you know what, though? At this point, maybe the doctors on the board need to think about allowing themselves to be dissolved. I mean, fight, but say, you know what? If Tennessee wants to be the state that dissolved its medical board, and they'll, as you say, they'll reconstitute it with crazies and say, we didn't dissolve it. It's just got different people on it. And I don't know. They might need to maybe well, make this listen their to last this, stand. Listen to this uh, paragraph. In oh, the wake gosh, of that more. meeting. Yes. The health department fired its top vaccine official Mm -hmm. and stopped advocating for children to be vaccinated, not just against COVID, but all illnesses. Yeah. The shift prompted a fierce backlash and the health department reversed some of the changes, but not all later. Hmm. There's a lot of reversals going on. Right. Senator Heidi Campbell, Democrat Nashville, minority member of the Joint Government Operations Committee, said Republicans in June used the threat of dissolution to weaponize the committee against the health department. Now they're doing the same thing against Board of Medical Examiners. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is what happens at local level when you have a Republican supermajority, folks. Yeah. Welcome and to Tennessee. And so if you're going to turn to the issue of, okay, well, what about the 2024 and 2022 elections? And, you know, how are they setting themselves up to steal them? Well, look. Mm-hmm. And it's not just yes. elections. As a matter of fact, that's a great uh, great point there. I was hoping to, to segue around to it. Is uh, Again, it, it's got a very... Uh, obvious parallel in that, that they are, uh, you know, now we're going to rig who can tell you what is and isn't like actual medicine and whether it's acceptable to treat people in this state with, you know, pseudoscience or voodoo science, depending on how you look at it. And uh, just the same, we're going to be replacing the people who are in charge of declaring how many votes went for this candidate versus how many votes went for that candidate. And if they don't like the outcome, they can switch it. Uh, And same or dissolve the committee. Yeah, right. Or whatever they same sort of thing. Uh, Interesting that they uh, now feel emboldened and empowered to do this in every field. It's the same play. And so uh, uh, I, I, you know, it's Wednesday. I have to go a little bit early, but uh, too late for that. Too late to go early as Yogi Berry used to say. (laughs) Uh, But the thing is that uh, this all matters. And so my my final point here is local elections matter, whether it's school Mm, board in Virginia or uh, Senate races in Tennessee. And if you're going to take the attitude that I didn't get everything I wanted and so I'm not going to vote because I'm just not motivated, I just got two words for you, as we say in New York, and it ain't happy birthday. (laughs) Okay. Man, uh, well, it is. It's extraordinarily important. And uh, now Tennessee, uh, well, uh, they deserve what they get. Well, I don't want to be interested in politics. Well, look what happens when you don't get yeah. involved. Now you got a situation. If you if you like your doctor, John Reagan says, uh, go to hell. I'm dissolving him. All yeah, right. Really? That's that. Because remember, small government. And I guess it's small uh, okay. if you dissolve parts. Uh, on the of way it. out the door, uh, this uh, just briefing from Kyle Cheney last night from Politico, which I thought was pretty good, on what Benny Thompson's been up to. Committee's not had any direct engagement with former Vice President Mike Pence yet. That's kind of mm-hmm. important because Pence sort of knows some stuff about what happened on January 6th. Right. That's why they wanted to hang him. Yeah. He's still hopeful Meadows cooperates. The committee received an eight hour <laughs> briefing from staff on Monday that covered every aspect of the committee's work, yeah. including a Capitol Police led tour the Capitol to all of the sites breached by rioters. Hmm. Drunk dots there. Thompson said the committee hadn't yet begun writing its final report, but was in the process of engaging outside experts to help piece it together and hopes to present findings in a way that mirrors the 9-11 commission two decades ago. So that's where things stand there. With that, I'll say uh, goodbye for now, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay. Unless uh, you've been dissolved. Right. I'm thinking about it. Yeah, trying to be dissolved. (laughs) <laughs> sounds painful do my best man okay, okay. take well, care and, and somehow you. or other we'll try to come up for some material for tomorrow Jeez, i don't know how they're gonna no, 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 we're gonna do that mm. it's probably another state gonna try to dissolve something so watch out for that yeah. all right all right take care and i'll talk to you okay very good thanks i'll do my best to stay resolved solved i don't know if no one dissolves i don't know what the opposite is we'll let the etymologists go to work on that one all right, boy, there's an awful lot uh, to that. And uh, yeah, huh. now it's tempting me to go back over to that Barton Gelman article, except I did, I sat down and finally read it yesterday. And it's very good, and you should read it. It's very long. And I think it, I think I might have to, like, I might have to read it. 
and discuss it. But but it might take it might be a Friday thing because it just might take too long to do. All right. Well, at any rate, uh, okay. Uh, oh yes, yeah, so Greg's reminding me. Uh, stay solvent, which is always good advice. Generally speaking, uh, usually used in the financial sense, but that ain't happening. So at least I can just do it in the physical sense. All right. There's like a million things going on, a million different directions we could go in, and just uh, a minute or two to do them before we leave for another break. So that ain't happening, and we'll move on to something else instead. Let's see. What do I have that uh, might fit into this? Hmm. Oh, uh, nothing, basically, is what I'm, I'm going to say. I'm going to go to the Twitter feed for that and... Uh, because all the other stories are just going to take too long to read. And pretty soon my alarm's going to go off. I should just go straight to that. Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, were there other things that I wanted to bring up from yesterday? Mm-hmm. Let's see. Oh, just uh, I'll read you some good thoughts that others had on Twitter to fill the time here. I just happened to notice uh, the tweet from... Our schoolie that uh, I picked up on this morning, just sort of noticing, it's uh, kind of astounding that the fervid MAGA loyalists never question why Trump didn't pardon his January 6th mob while he still could. You'd think they might notice that. That is an interesting observation. I've always wondered why they didn't take that, you know, take umbrage at that. But uh, I assume that they that they are just saying that must be the way to make America great again, for whatever reason. As more of these people now face jail time. Um, I noticed, for instance, that, uh, oh yeah, no, I think we did make mention of the, uh, the, the weird lady whose name I can't remember anymore, who, the one who flew on a private jet, who chartered a private jet to fly to DC for the January 6th insurrection. I'll see if I can scroll back and find her name. Probably won't be until after the break before I hit that again. But anyway, she's getting set to report to prison for her, what, 30 day, or I think it's 30 days, maybe 60 days in jail. And she's treating it like a spa getaway somehow, circulating TikTok video of herself, uh, talking about how much weight she's planning to lose, doing yoga and drinking protein shakes in jail, like they have those things. All right, welcome back now to the Kate Horner Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Ah, just a few other random thoughts that uh, as I was scrolling through Twitter. Uh, oh, Jenna Ryan, by the way, is the name of the uh, particular lunatic who's uh, getting set to enter prison as though she were Dewey Oxberger from Stripes, right? The way he entered the army. What do you got? A, a six, eight week training program here, which is perfect for me, right? It's going to go really well for her in, in, in jail. Anyway, the other uh, another throwaway item of the day you may have seen uh, crazy Lauren Boebert tweeting out a picture she took with her kids all holding uh, AR-15 type rifles. And some of them are quite young, of course. Uh, this in response to Congressman Thomas Massey, who circulated what a photo that purported to be his Christmas card uh, in, uh, again, also... Um, seated on the couch with the family, everybody holding various semi-automatic weapons. Uh, and the idea, of course, being, haha, guns, we're awesome. But Ma Massey's uh, thing was particularly irritating, apparently, to people because it was put out. He put the thing out like two days after the Michigan school shooting, which was just sort of an interesting Christmas sentiment, not only one that the Christmas season is, and there's two ways of looking at it. One that Christmas season is about uh, teasing and upsetting others, or two that at the very least the Christmas season is about taking pictures of yourself so as to say to others, "Ha ha, look what I have," which is a very Christmassy thing to do. And Lauren Bobert, of course, joins in on that and I was just I will point out even if they actually use these as their Christmas cards I was just going to think I'm thinking of the kids in here and you know lots of people thinking about them and saying oh my gosh child abuse and they're going to grow up traumatized I don't know whether they will or not lots of people grow up just fine and and well <clears throat> they're sometimes a little stupid about things but uh, some people actually do I guess grow up to become intelligent uh, out of a situation like this and but, but also say I'm used to guns we grew up around guns, but I also believe in, you know, better gun safety than than this. I believe um, I saw, uh, I can't tell from the picture 
myself just because it's kind of small i'd have to enlarge it and look and the the lighting isn't particularly good but i think brandon freeman was saying uh that uh the Boberts picture was particularly dangerous as uh <clears throat> they had uh taken the photo again it's kids and i mean i don't know they look to be between say 15 and 8 perhaps there's four of them uh all with actually with magazines in in the well so you know not smart really for taking the pictures that way but they'll all say we're you know we're trained in gun safety uh, there are such people and they grow up and and they think that uh, being around guns when they were kids means that uh, no one will have an accident around them later. And I don't really know. There's no particular logic to it. Anyway, I just was wa- you know, musing aloud about it that, uh, you know, they think this is such a clever, fun, harmless trick to do. But if you were to, let's say, as a student in school right now, particularly in Michigan, perhaps particularly in Oakland County, Michigan, if you were to draw a picture of Lauren Boebert's Christmas card or Tom Massey's Christmas card, you would be thrown out of school right now. I, I assume like that they learned their lesson that they should throw those kids out, even if the parents won't take them out. But yeah, uh, and you can just say, well, you can then go to the press and start a GoFundMe and say, well, I was expelled from school because of the war on Christmas. That can be your excuse. Anyway, I gather this was going to become a pastime among Republicans now who are going to trade outrageous pictures of their families. Look what we're doing. We're playing with guns because guns aren't a toy. Uh, that whole talking point has you know, died a million deaths, of course, already. Anyway, let's see. Other things. Let me get to the larger stories now that we have a little bit more time available to us. And we can uh, dispense with some of these smaller items. Uh, when we, um, we'll have some more for you as we run up against our next break when that happens. All right. Let's see. Um, yeah, uh, as far as what Greg was asking me about procedurally, I did put aside a few items that we could read that might help clear things up. But I think it's actually it is actually pretty clear, uh, even though Aaron Fritchner here, uh, communications for uh, communications chief for Congressman Don Beyer here from Virginia, uh, who was joking, but actually does a pretty good job summing it up. So to clear a Senate Republican filibuster against raising the debt ceiling and to let it be raised by a simple majority vote, Republicans are going to help pass a standalone bill that overrides their own filibuster rather than just not filibustering to begin with. Do I have this right? Uh, It sounds dumb, but yeah, that's exactly it. And that's probably the most concise explanation there is for it. And if you don't, you know, I don't know. I think everybody kind of gets it. There was also, I put aside uh, some screenshots of the actual legislation uh, whose tweet is this? Jennifer Shutt, S-H-U-T-T, uh, congressional reporter for Congressional Quarterly and Roll Call. And I think she, what's the link to? Is it a link to the Roll Call thing or to the entire viewer of the bill? Oh, yeah, okay. So now we've got the entirety of the bill, which <clears throat> is 10 pages long, but as legislation goes, not particularly long, and the the pages aren't, you know, entirely filled with type. But I guess she must have grabbed the relevant parts, but we might have to go over the whole thing here. So what is this legislation? What is it that they're doing here? Uh, this is interesting. And and they've also done another interesting thing here, which is they've pulled another one of our fun favorite legislative tricks. Uh, it is a standalone measure, as we just read, but it's not a newly they didn't newly generate it as a as a house uh bill they pulled the old trick of taking up a <clears throat> a senate a senate passed bill that was sitting in the house for its consideration and swapping out the text with something else so the rules committee took that shortcut instead of you know designing legislation from the ground up and then bringing it to committee and doing the markup thing and then reporting it out and then bringing it to the floor. They wanted to make things move faster. So they took what was sitting around, Senate Bill 
S610, which I guess was originally the Protecting Medicare and American Farmers from Sequester Cuts Act. <laughs> uh, whose bill is that? I don't know. We could look it up. I mean, does that really matter? But it might tell part of the story to see whose bill did they gut. Did they take the bill, you know, did they get permission to take the bill from a willing ally in the Senate? Or did they take some Senate jerks bill that they hate and gut that because they don't like the guy? Let's see what's going on. It's S610. We'll check over at congress.gov. Uh, let's see. Resolution, resolution, committee report, bill. Here we go. Uh, protecting Medicare and American farmers from sequester cuts. Act. Ah, it's Tim Kaine's bill. So <clears throat> I guess he must have maybe given the nod to doing that or perhaps the text of the legislation got included in a larger bill elsewhere. So it's not imperative to him that S610 pass or maybe they're simply amending this adding it to the text of the bill, or are they, uh, I don't know, it looks like they're, so, so they're uh, gonna. No, I guess they're just appending something on to that bill and then they'll pass that as well. Okay, so all oh, that explains the headlines that I saw. Yeah, let me see. The, the, some of the bills I put away, or the, the pieces I put away about this thing, uh, mentioned. You know, something about, um, I don't remember what, Medicare, Medicaid, God knows what, but uh, apparently included that stuff in there. Oh, fast track debt limit process added to spending cuts delay bill. Okay. I don't know. One or, one or two of the headlines, I think, made some mention, some vague mention of uh, there being some <clears throat> um, other implications in this bill and i guess that's the reason so maybe i should go back to jennifer shutt's tweet to see the relevant part she puts here in section eight on page seven is where this begins uh so i guess everything up through page six is the old bill as designed by senator kane and then section eight being added here expedited procedures for considering an increase in the debt limit so let's let's just take a look at what it actually says in this section the term joint resolution means a joint resolution that one is introduced by the majority leader of the Senate or a designee during the period beginning on the date of enactment of this act and ending on December 31st, 2021. OK, so they were giving themselves a window. Uh, this one time exception can only happen between now and the end of the year. And also a joint resolution which does not have a preamble. <laughs> that seems Less than important, but I guess uh, they just don't want anybody monkeying with the meaning of things. Uh, the title of which is as follows. So they just they they lay out the rules. The joint resolution will be called joint resolution relating to increasing the debt limit and for the matter after the resolving clause of which is as follows. So they're just basically writing the bill piece by piece here that the limitation under Section 3101B of Title 31 United States Code, as most recently increased by Public Law 117-50, or 31 U.S. Code 3101, is increased by blank number of dollars, the blank space being appropriately filled in with the dollar amount of the increase. Good instruction there. Section 8B Expedited consideration in the Senate. Placement on the calendar. Upon introduction in the Senate, the joint resolution shall be placed immediately on the calendar. Seems like a good thing to do. Proceeding to consideration is next. In general, notwithstanding Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, that's the cloture rule, it is in order, not later than January 15th, 2022, even though a previous motion to the same effect has been disagreed to, Ooh. to move to proceed to the consideration of the joint resolution. That's uh, So that little parenthetical part that makes it sound complicated is even if they have a vote to on a motion to proceed to this joint resolution that they're writing in Section 8 here, uh, nonetheless, it will be in order not later than January 15th of next year to consider this joint resolution, even if they vote against it before then. So, okay, that kind of locks it in. The procedure itself, for a motion to proceed to the consideration of the joint resolution, 
One, all points of order against the motion are waived. Two, the motion is not debatable. Three, the motion is not subject to a motion to postpone. Four, a motion to reconsider the vote by which the motion is agreed to or disagreed to shall not be in order. And five, if the motion is agreed to, the joint resolution shall remain the unfinished business until disposed of. By the way, what this is really reminding me of here is, uh, one, this is language with which the committee doing the work is intimately familiar. Reminder, this was done in the House Rules Committee. So they write rules like this all the time for House procedure. So this is very interesting that they are dictating the rules of Senate procedure. And the Senate, uh, you know, will adopt, if it adopts them, it adopts them. Then it acts on its own accord. Uh, ordinarily, you would say, well, the House can't write the rules of procedure for the Senate. That's ridiculous. Well, they can write them down and hand them to the Senate. And if the Senate adopts them, then the Senate has written them for all intents and purposes, and they work. But what's interesting here is, uh, one, you worry a little bit about, are you sure that you guys understand the Senate rules well enough to make sure you, you know, have closed all the loopholes here? But I assume they've consulted with Senate procedural experts in this, but maybe not. Uh, we'll wait and see. But in addition, um, among the many, you know, comments that this procedure is going to raise among filibuster reform proponents and opponents alike, uh, one that should come up but might not otherwise is the frequent complaint of filibuster reform opponents who say, well, we can't turn the Senate into the House. We don't want to turn the Senate into the House. Well, <laughs> the Senate has just turned into the House, ladies and gentlemen, because the House Rules Committee is writing special rules for the consideration of Senate measures. Now, it might just be this one time, but you can, of course, believe that there will be pressure later on to do this for other things. It won't work in the same way. I know people won't really understand this and they'll be saying, and, and it might be, when I said there was a lot of layers to this, I meant it. I think that it's possible that Mitch McConnell and maybe other even Democratic opponents of filibuster reform might be thinking, this is fantastic because this will frustrate the hell out of the Democratic base and filibuster reform proponents who don't perhaps understand everything that there is to understand about this stuff, but will instead see that uh, <clears throat> when they put their minds to it, they can work out one-time workarounds around the filibuster. But again, it has to have Republican agreement, Republican complicity in order to do it. And they may, you might, you know, if you're still wondering, well, why would they agree to go along with this? If the explanation we gave you earlier isn't enough, then, you know, which is, of course, that, you know, there are Republicans who are afraid to default but desperately want to avoid going on record to vote against, you know, that default, to, to, to vote to avoid that default by raising the debt ceiling. But here they can vote instead to make it possible to raise the debt ceiling without cooperation from them, except that, of course, it requires their cooperation to grant the uh, waiver of their cooperation, the waiver of the necessity of their cooperation, I guess. So they can't escape it entirely. But if that isn't enough for you, then you might be able to get some reluctant Republicans to go along with it by saying this will cause Democratic pro-reform activists to lose their minds. They'll say, why don't you just do this again for voting rights without ever, you know, coming around to the understanding of, well, we won't grant our cooperation for it on voting rights. We will grant it for the debt ceiling for and, and for two reasons. One, we're afraid of defaulting. And two, for those who aren't afraid of defaulting, but still need a reason to vote for this, perhaps, uh, it will create chaos and resentment in the Democratic ranks. So I don't want to say don't let it because you should be, you know, pressuring for filibuster reform with every tool you've got. But uh, it's an unlikely vehicle for a one-time exception for anything other than this item, this this debt ceiling increase. All right. Well, at any rate, uh, yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting, the whole, uh, th there goes the don't turn the Senate into the House thing. 
So we left off, uh, and that was the end of section 8-2, eight, eight, subsection 2. Now, floor consideration, the rules for how you'll handle it in the Senate. In general, if the Senate proceeds to consideration of the joint resolution, and I feel like they actually have to, given what was in section 2 here, one, all points of order against the joint resolution and against consideration of the joint resolution are waived. Two, debate on the joint resolution and all debatable motions and appeals in connection therewith shall be limited to not more than 10 hours, which shall be divided equally between the chairman and ranking member of the Committee on Finance. Three, an amendment to the joint resolution is not in order. So that was what I was checking for. Because, uh, right, if that were the case, I would simply say, oh, well, I'll just pass this joint resolution. And then once it's passed with 10 Republican votes for cloture, or once you get those cloture votes in and you pass the thing, then I would just go and amend it and say, guess what? I'm abolishing the debt ceiling. So, all right, they were smart enough or dumb enough to include that. So they can't make an amendment. Uh, number four, a motion to postpone or a motion to commit the joint resolution is not in order. Uh, that's like the motion to recommit in the House. And five, a motion to proceed to the consideration of other business is not in order. So there you go. Vote on passage. The vote on passage shall occur immediately following the conclusion of the debate on the joint resolution and a single quorum call if requested in accordance with the rules of the Senate. Rulings of the chair on procedure are addressed here as well. Appeals from the decisions of the chair relating to the application of this paragraph or the rules of the Senate, as the case may be. Uh, the, hmm, is that, I, I've missed a word here. Uh, okay. So appeals from the decisions of the rule of the chair, uh, as the case may be, to... Next page, the procedure relating to the joint resolution shall be decided without debate. So non-debatable appeals, meaning you can't filibuster on an appeal. Single measure authorized is the next section here. It shall not be in order to consider more than one joint resolution under the procedure under this paragraph. And a sunset, it shall be not be in order to consider a joint resolution under the procedures under this paragraph after January 16th, 2022. And next section here, rules of the Senate. This subsection is enacted by Congress, A, as an exercise of the rulemaking power of the Senate, and as such is deemed a part of the rules of the Senate, but applicable only with respect to the procedure to be followed in the Senate in the case of a joint resolution and supersede other rules only to the extent that they are inconsistent with such rules and B, with full recognition of the constitutional right of the Senate to change the rules so far as relating to the procedure of the Senate at any time in the same manner and to the same extent as in the case of any other rule of the Senate. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so, well, that also helps address the other question of, well, if you're changing the rules of the Senate, people ask this one, if you're changing the rules of the Senate, um... Sure, we have heard that John Cornyn, for reasons of his own, and other senators for reasons of their own, are going to agree to provide 10 Republican votes for cloture if necessary, if anyone were to filibuster this uh, bill. Uh, that, well, hmm, do they even have to? Yeah, I guess they'll have to now. They would be filibustering consideration of S610 as amended by the House. So you can still filibuster that. And they're saying that if anyone does filibuster it, at least 10 Republicans will vote yes on cloture so that you can get to a final vote on S610. They'll pass that, whereupon there will be operative, essentially a, 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 an, a standing, but not for very long, order that <laughs> expires... On January 15th, allowing for consideration of a joint resolution that raises the debt ceiling and is not amendable and uh, appeals of which, uh, appeals of the rulings of the chair about which are not debatable. Right. So, and limited to 10 hours debate. Wow. Okay. It is. It's very convoluted and weird. 
And it will make people ask for the same procedure to be used again later, but it's just not uh, there. But what about this? They say, uh, if you're changing the rules of the Senate, cloture on a... Uh, a cloture on any uh, on any bill to change the rules should require, according to Rule 22, a two thirds majority, 67 votes, if everybody's there. Although, um, hmm, is there's yeah, I guess uh, you you it probably won't come into play. But when they're doing the two thirds thing, um, it doesn't require an affirmative 67. It just requires two thirds of those present and voting. So they could, and that's another workaround that they could have tried, but I don't think they're going to, but I, I, they might have gone that way and said, sure, it's a rules change. So it requires a two thirds vote for cloture, but we're just going to, you know, a certain number of Republican senators are simply going to absent themselves such that you'll be able to achieve the two thirds. But I don't know what, how the numbers would work out, especially if there were still some Republicans who were bitter about this and intended to stick around and, and vote no. But I think it was probably achievable. But instead, they simply said, well, this, doesn't, this isn't really a change to the standing rules. This is more along the lines of what they would call a standing order, except it doesn't stand for very long, right? A temporary rule. That's how the Senate sort of handles temporary rules changes without running afoul of its standing rules. They will sometimes agree, you know, sometimes at the beginning of a Senate, sometimes uh, at any point, but the, for the balance of the current Congress, for let's say, uh, the following procedures will be uh, followed. And it uh, doesn't necessarily look forward beyond the current Congress, although you can do a standing order that lasts longer. They just tend to, to limit them to the current Congress. Anyway, that's just, more weedy stuff than you, well, more than you'll get anywhere else anyway. And I hope this, I don't know whether this made it better or worse trying to explain it. But at the very least, I think you can come away with talking points that you can use to, to, to talk things through in case you run into somebody who is uh, embittered by the refusal of the Senate to allow a similar workaround for voting rights or any other uh, any of the other more controversial among Republicans, controversial measures. That's why it's not available. This is a, a, a unique situation in which Republicans have agreed to do this stupid thing. Uh, but also you can have a good laugh at anybody who still cries about turning the Senate into the House. OK, let's see other things that we have on tap. Things I want to check into here. Maybe I should read the roll. I'll skim over the roll call. Uh, piece that Jennifer Shutt actually wrote up on this thing just to sort of round things out. And maybe we'll get a couple of comments from senators uh, reported here to give you some insight into why they're doing it and see if anybody hits on the same points here. House passes debt limit process. Medicare cuts delay bill. And I wonder whether that was, uh, yeah, there were some I think I know there were some House members who were unhappy with S six ten as it stood before they made this amendment. So there was some question of whether or not they were going to be able to get enough votes to adopt six ten S six ten as amended. Compromise bill would allow for filibuster proof debt limit increase. That's the subheader here. Jennifer Shutt teamed up with Lindsey McPherson on this. The House passed legislation Tuesday that would limit Senate debate on a separate debt ceiling increase bill to 10 hours, creating a temporary loophole in that chamber's 60 vote legislative filibuster rules. The bill, which would also delay scheduled cuts in Medicare and other programs, that's sections one through seven of the bill passed on a 222 to 212 vote. The measure is expected to get a Senate vote this week, completing the first of two steps lawmakers have decided will be needed to pass a debt limit bill this time around. The legislative vehicle is an unrelated bill that previously passed both chambers with amendments, allowing Senate leaders to avoid time consuming motions to proceed in that chamber. Instead, only one cloture vote would be needed. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who briefed his caucus at lunch on Tuesday, blessed the arrangement, mm, bless you, uh, in comments to reporters. He said the new debt limit measure 
could pass as early as Thursday, tomorrow. I'm confident this particular procedure, coupled with the avoidance of Medicare cuts, will achieve enough Republican support to clear the 60-vote threshold, McConnell said. But what if it doesn't? I don't know. Anyway, uh, the debt limit uh, provision will do all the things that we said it would do. I'm trying to see whether any of that uh, helps clear things up. But you know what? I can make that decision on the other side of this break. And in fact, I'm going to have to. I'm forced by events to wait for two minutes. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the k in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Does everybody get it? I mean, I might be doing too much on this thing, but we'll, uh, I don't know. There's a couple of things uh, procedural to spend some time on. But I think this actually helps clear it up. Uh, we, we might possibly have done better just by reading the roll call article. But I wanted to have some fun reading through the legislation and just seeing every piece of it. And it wasn't that long. All right. But I think a pretty good explanation of it. And this is a good recap of the two dates that were included in there. In case that left any confusion in your mind, the debt limit provision would allow Senate Majority Leader Charles E. Schumer, you know him, to introduce a joint resolution, which has the force of law, just like a bill, provided, of course, it is passed in both houses and signed by the president, um, and does it does, in fact, require a signature. I think there is another one that's passed by two, the concurrent resolution, which doesn't have the force of law and isn't signed by the president. So anyway, they, they went with the right one here. It could have been just a bill, I guess. Mm, maybe not. Anyway, the point is uh, that this means Schumer can introduce or uh, has to in order to get this done, introduce this joint resolution no later than December 31st. So before the end of the year, the joint resolution has to be introduced. That shouldn't be difficult because it was written in there. Section eight contains all the language except for what goes in the blank. That's the important part, of course. So. No later than December 31st, he's got to introduce this joint resolution to increase the $28.9 trillion debt ceiling by an amount yet to be determined. It would then automatically be placed on the Senate calendar, and it would be in order to proceed to its consideration at any time through January 15th, even if there's a prior vote that says no, believe it or not. Debate on the measure would be limited to 10 hours with no amendments. Motions to commit or to move on to other business wouldn't be allowed. Then there would be a simple majority threshold for passage or 51 votes if all senators are present. Um, that also should be probably commented on just for a moment. There isn't. You, you would have noticed. Here's a good reason to read the text of the bill. You will have noticed that this is a correct statement. Motions to commit not allowed. You heard about that. And then there would sim be a simple majority threshold for passage or 51 votes if all senators are present. You may have noticed that there's nothing about that in the text that we read. It doesn't say anywhere that it shall take 51 votes or a majority, a simple majority to pass. And that is because you don't need to say it. That's the default rule when uh, uh, there's no filibuster in play. So everything passes with a simple majority, no matter what it is, except, I guess, for the ratification of a treaty. True. Uh, the only thing that stands in the way, of course, is the filibuster. And with that eliminated, right, you know, so when they used to do the old formulation, when Chuck Schumer himself used to say, everyone knows it takes 60 votes to pass anything in the Senate. 
Well, not to pass it, just to get to the vote on it does take 60 votes. So anyway, as I said, you know, that's the default state of things in the Senate. It's always assumed that it takes a bare majority, simple majority to pass something. That's why it didn't have to be stated in the text that we read, and that's why it wasn't stated in the text that we read. Okay, let's see. Uh, next up, the special procedure would be available for one time only, wouldn't be applicable to any other piece of legislation, and would expire on January 16th. Uh, so, by the way, uh, what that means is that if uh, Trump attacks the Capitol between, you know, lays siege to the Capitol between January 1st and January 16th, and prevents the Senate from coming into session and adopting that joint resolution, then the debt ceiling limit won't be raised and he'll force the default. So just like when it was his theory that he could prevent Biden from being certified on January 6th by uh, either by sacking the Capitol and making it impossible for them to hold the vote or by, you know, staying the proceedings in some other way onto, you know, past the magical date of January 6th, that something magical would happen and he would become president and Biden wouldn't. Here they can do the same. So I guess uh, increased security in the Capitol between January. Well, let's just start now and keep it that way until January 16th, even though they've expressed no interest in it. Uh, you know, who knows? That could become the talk of Gab or parlor any moment now. All right, so where were we? Oh, yes, it wasn't yet clear when the debt limit measure would be introduced or taken up sometime between now and the end of the year, or in what dollar amount it would be raised by. Some independent forecasts estimate it would take something like $2 trillion in additional borrowing authority to make it past the November 2022 midterm elections, if that's their goal. And that may very well be their goal. Uh, reminder here that, of course, this is borrowing authority to pay for the spending already approved by the previous Republican Congress. Not that they will admit to that or not that they won't tell you the exact opposite. But uh, thrill goes up their legs that they'll be able to pin a $2 trillion addition to the debt ceiling, if not the actual debt itself, on Democrats. You should probably be aware of that, too. It won't really help very much, but... Yeah, Republicans will say they just added $2 trillion to the deficit. No, they didn't. They gave authority to, to do that later. If people decide that's what they want to do, they now have the authority to do that. But that's not actually what they did. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has urged lawmakers to act before December 15th on the limit. Hmm, we'll see whether that happens. After which she said that it's possible the Treasury won't be able to meet all U.S. financial obligations on time. But she also said there's a high degree of confidence that Treasury can make all of its required payments immediately after that date. And independent forecasters have said there may be a few more weeks of wiggle room if needed. So, of course, they'll take it. Congressional leaders have said they'd prefer to deal with the issue before December 15th, however. Then they could. We always said we wanted a process that was simple, not risky, not convoluted, didn't put us through a lot of different votes, Schumer told reporters after Democratic caucus lunch Tuesday. We Democrats were always willing to carry the burden. That's what's going to happen. I don't know whether he got his wish on it not being convoluted or not. But yeah, you know, if they that, that's sort of a weird thing, too. If they were always willing to carry the burden, then why didn't they do it in reconciliation? And I don't know. I, I, I can't answer that. There was no, they just, they said, they're going to put our foot down. We're not doing it in reconciliation. And then they were like, oh crap, we got to, now we got to come up with something even more convoluted than reconciliation to do this in. But that's okay because we were always willing to carry the burden. I don't know. Anyway, there's other stuff in this bill and it's actually covered here. We might as well read it. Medicare and farm cuts. What's this about? The debt limit process language is tucked into a bill that would avoid several Medicare cuts that would otherwise be triggered on January 1st. Aha. Uh -huh. Including those, or rather, including across the board reductions to provider reimbursements as well as separate cuts to physician and laboratory services payments. The broader Medicare cuts would be delayed 
until March 31st, 2022, after which 1% reductions would kick in. Half of what would otherwise take place through January 30th, unless Congress delays the cuts again. And I think you'll probably see him do that, like the doc fix, just getting kicked down the road and passed over and over again. The measure would delay a separate set of Medicare cuts, as well as reductions affecting a broad range of federal programs, including agricultural subsidies, military retirement funds, and several new programs established under Democrats' $2.2 trillion budget reconciliation bill, if that's enacted this year. How about that? Hmm. So uh, let me read that again. Measure would delay several new programs or delay cuts in several new programs that were established. Hmm. Uh, is that what they're trying to say? That would delay how they have they're being established. How come they're being cut? I don't think so. The measure would delay a separate set of Medicare cuts as well as reductions in agriculture subsidies military retirement funds, and several new programs. Yeah, hmm. Established under the Dems' $2.2 trillion budget reconciliation bill, if that's enacted this year. Ah, where's the uh, parliamentarian and um, and Kent Conrad to say that you can't pass a joint resolution delaying cuts that will be made in a reconciliation bill that hasn't passed yet? Okay, whatever. I always thought that was possible anyway, so... Don't wake those guys up and ask them about that. Under the 2010 statutory pay-as-you-go law, those cuts would be triggered 15 days after the end of this session. Instead, the provision would delay the reductions by a year to 2023, unless waived again in subsequent legislation. Just so, there you go. that's just another issue, by the way. Whenever you see people, budget hawk types, say, well, what we'll do is we'll make for you know, mandatory sequestration or across-the-board cuts that start on this date automatically. What you're seeing here is what Congress actually does with those things, since they can make their own rules, is they say, well, the law says those cuts start on January 1st, 2022. But if before then you say, eh, January 1st, 2023, then they get moved. So they're not particularly hard lines. Let's see, what else here? The dollar amount required. That gets some discussion. The debt limit provision would enable Republicans to avoid voting directly for a debt limit increase while forcing Democrats to vote on a specific dollar figure rather than simply suspending the limit to a date out in the future. That was something Republicans insisted on for the short-term patch in October that lifted the ceiling by $480 billion. It's important to restore the process of raising the debt ceiling with a number so the voters can take a look and see what the reality is. John Cornyn said on Tuesday, of course, he told you the opposite of the reality in terms of how the votes are going. But at least 10 Senate Republicans would still need to vote for cloture to get around the 60 vote threshold for the underlying bill. That is S610. After the October bill passed, McConnell said Republicans wouldn't help Democrats pass legislation to suspend or raise the nation's debt ceiling again. But they will. After Tuesday's lunch, McConnell said the latest agreement doesn't violate any principle that he laid out earlier. Ready for this? The red line is intact. The red line is that you have a simple majority party line vote on the debt ceiling. That's exactly where we will end up. That's not the red line, of course. I mean, if that were the red line, then he would be right. But the red line was... Republicans won't help Democrats pass legislation to suspend or raise the nation's debt ceiling again, and they will by providing votes for cloture on S610, which establishes a new procedure for voting at least one time on the debt ceiling. So, no, they didn't stick to their principles, but also, no, no one will ever get that. You will, but no one else will. GOP senators so far have been lukewarm on the procedural change that McConnell briefed members about. How is that different than just voting to get on the measure? Mitt Romney asked on Tuesday. I mean, that's what uh, roll call with their pop up ads, the different sizes. And when they rotate the ads, all the text on the page moves. All right. So Mitt Romney says, how's that different from just voting to get on the measure? I mean, that's what was the option last time. It took 10 Republicans to do that. To create a rule would require 10 Republicans to do that. It seems to me that's the same thing over again, and it is. 
but Mitch McConnell doesn't want it to be. So he says it's not. That's all. That's all there is. Mike Rounds of South Dakota was among the Republicans who voted for cloture in October, along with McConnell and Cornyn. He said he wouldn't vote to advance the debt limit process bill this time, however. Last time I voted to call the question to put them in a position to where they could vote up or down on a debt limit increase, Rounds said on Tuesday. This time around, they needed to do it on their own. And, you know, they will have help. They just won't have his help, I guess. Richard Shelby, Alabama, of course, was another GOP senator who voted for cloture on the short-term patch. Like Rounds, Shelby said Tuesday he wouldn't support advancing the new package to a final vote. Others who voted no on cloture in October hinted they might be reconsidering. They include Mississippi's Roger Wicker and North Dakota's Kevin Kramer. So previous no's might turn to yes in order to give us the 10 votes we need. Wicker said he might vote to advance the measure if it helps get past the debt ceiling issue, while Kramer said suspending the Medicare cuts was important. That's an interesting reason. Uh, it may be the, la- the least bad deal, Kramer said. I wouldn't call it a great deal, like Donald Trump would, except he's not going to call it a good deal. Cornyn suggested he'll likely back cloture again this time. I'm certainly not going to vote to cut Medicare reimbursement, he said. And then finally, more on changing the rules. On Monday, when news of the debt limit process fix began circulating, Mike Lee of Utah tweeted that it would be akin to, quote, in all caps, nuking the filibuster, but nuking it and then restoring it. So, you know, that's interesting. Democrats in October weighed temporarily changing the Senate rules to allow a simple majority vote for passage of a debt limit bill. But Joe Manchin, among others, expressed opposition, and it was clear Republicans wouldn't support changing the filibuster rule permanently. This time is different in that it would require 60 votes effectively to temporarily change the rules to allow the expedited debt ceiling process. The legislation acknowledges it would mean changing the chamber's rules, but also stipulates it's applicable only to this one instance and that there's full recognition of the constitutional right of the Senate to change the rules at any time in the same manner and to do this and to the same extent as in the case of any other rule of the Senate. That is to say, it only requires 51 votes or a majority of those present in voting to adopt a new rules change. The 67 requirement is only if there's a filibuster. And if there ain't going to be one or you get past it, then majority rules. The end. There was something else in this that uh, made me stop and think. Oh, right. Hmm. Uh, when Bill, when Mike Lee was saying it would be akin to nuking the filibuster. And I was, oh, yes, right. I was thinking about, well, that's an extraordinarily small, a very tactical nuclear weapon, to be sure. Uh, I was reminded by something that Greg was mentioning, too, when we were discussing this thing. Um, Well, that and uh, what we're discussing this, or but also actually maybe during the discussion about what Tennessee was doing about dissolving the board and then then resolving it with other people on it instead. Uh, Or, oh, yes, right, getting rid of, oh, right, uh, when they couldn't decide as between the Tennessee legislators and the members of the medical board, what they had done here. The, the medical board said, oh, we, we didn't change the rule. We just took the wording of the rule off our website. And the legislators say, no, 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 what you really did here, whether it's, you know, legal uh, or not, uh, well, you really, you, you rescinded the rule because if it's not on your website or published anywhere, it can't really be a rule. That's going to make for an interesting court case, by the way. And I think the legislators might actually have a shot at winning that one. But it reminded me of uh, some an episode from the 1975 rules change that finally did reform the cloture rules and, and lower the threshold for legis- regular legislative business from two-thirds to three-fifths, 67 down to 60. You know all the various rules about how to count those things. We've discussed those in the past. But... Uh, when they forced that rules change, it involved a couple of votes on appeals of the ruling of the chair about what they were actually doing, which had the effect of once they, when they would vote to table an appeal, had the effect of 
allowing for the underlying motion, that is to say that we should recognize our right to invoke cloture by majority vote when necessary. They forced that through and they got recognized, they got that principle recognized by the chair. One of the uh, parts of the compromise that finally settled the thing was that there ought to be a vote to negate the precedent established by the ruling of the chair and the tabling of the appeal of the ruling of the chair. And they said, we will, in other words, uh, appeal the ruling of the chair, win that vote, and or, or rather, uh, you know, uh, appeal for uh, a ruling from the chair that 51 or a bare majority vote is enough to invoke cloture if the Senate says so, and then go back and fearful of the um, the uh, the precedent that might set, there were some senators who said, all right, now that we've worked out a compromise, can we go back and have a vote that says that that vote doesn't count for anything anymore? Erase that precedent. And there was a big debate over whether erasing the precedent really did anything. You can take it off the books, but we all know what happened. And we all know that the inherent power to do it again by majority vote is vested in us by the Constitution. So does it really matter whether we erase this thing or not? Same sort of dynamic is erasing it just taking some words away but not changing what happened or the fact does the fact that the words don't appear in the proper place in the proper book that everybody considers to be the law and the uh you know the the uh determinative compilation compendium of all laws that could be applicable to others if it's not in there does it exist? Is it a law? Can you do it again? So same debate, interestingly, in two different contexts, but all about, I guess, legislatures invoking their particular brand of magic. All right. So where were we here? Keeping these measures separate from the revised fiscal 2022 defense authorization measure, as opposed to merging the two, as had been mulled earlier, may actually help gain GOP support for the maneuver. I think the defense bill, everybody kind of felt like is a big enough bill that needs to move on its own. National security is an issue that we've been batting around here now for the past several weeks, and we want to get that bill done, says Senator, Senate Minority Whip John Thune of South Dakota. Uh, there was another vehicle available which seems to fit. He didn't want to tag it on to uh, defense because that would entail... Uh, well, you know what? There's no real reason not to do it, but they probably objected to it. There were probably members, senators who said, uh, I, I feel like I have to vote for the defense bill and I don't want to vote yes on this debt ceiling trickery, the procedural trickery anyway. It's not nothing tricky about the debt ceiling part of it. Um, but so what? I mean, that's why you attach things to a must-pass bill. I don't know why they... Did that, but I guess they had another vehicle and it seemed to work. And people who had even uh, illogical objections, uh, doesn't really matter whether they're illogical. If they're going to state them and put their foot down, you got to find a way around them, even if they're, they don't know what they're talking about. Okay, well, I guess we're done with that, maybe. But I have a feeling there'll be more questions. We might be back on it tomorrow and Friday. Let me check in on a couple of other uh, interesting details. I mentioned to you the other day, I got to scroll down in order to get to this one, that there was more on the uh, Oklahoma National Guard front. You remember that controversy? Uh, this is from the Washington Post on November 30th. It's been waiting around to update you with by Alex Horton. National Guard members who refuse to be vaccinated against the coronavirus will be barred from training and have their pay withheld, the Pentagon said way back when, on Tuesday, right after Thanksgiving, I guess, in an apparent warning shot from the Biden administration to Republican governors looking to defy federal mandates. The directive from Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin comes a day after he rejected a request from Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt to exempt his state's National Guard members from the vaccine requirement. Stitt is the only governor, so far, to enact such a policy, though his countermand generated inquiries from leaders of other conservative leaning states interested in challenging president Biden's initiative to immunize the federal workforce and government contractors. 
In his guidance, Austin said all 2.1 million service members, including National Guard personnel under state command, are obligated to follow his August order instructing them to receive the vaccine. Failure to comply, he has said, will result in disciplinary action and imperil their careers. No credit or excused absence shall be afforded to members who do not participate in drills, training, or other duty due to failure to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19, Austin said. Uh, His memo appears to be in direct response to the unprecedented standoff with the Pentagon that has taken hold in Oklahoma, where thousands of National Guard personnel remain unvaccinated, and a spokesman for Stitt insisted Tuesday that the governor was within his authority to tell them they may sidestep federal directives. Stitt informed Austin on November 2nd that the order for all troops to get vaccinated violates the personal freedoms of many Oklahomans, and that a significant number of troops plan to forgo vaccination. He later ordered Brigadier General Thomas Mancino, commander of Oklahoma's roughly 8,200 National Guard troops, to execute a policy allowing members to avoid a vaccine while on state orders if they wished. So anyway, uh, without going too far into this and reading all the way through, because then we'll run out of time, you get the idea the Pentagon insists on its position. And I don't know, I'm not sure. Maybe the article has more, but we might actually still have to wait and see whether people just say, well, to hell with you. I'm not going to do it, and I'll see you in court. And they may lose in court, and they may be court-martialed along the way, but, you know, that might be what they decide to do with themselves. Um, on a similar front, I thought I would bring up this piece that I saw referred to elsewhere in another article about um, crazy things that are happening all over the place from military.com. Let's see. We've been there before, I think. Darwin has read things to us. Military.com, military news reported by Steve Benyon here. Ready for this one? Fellow guardsmen, get the pop-up out of the way. Fellow guardsmen push for soldier in January 6th mob to be allowed to continue serving. How do you like that? The chain of command for a National Guardsman who pleaded guilty to being part of the mob that ransacked the U.S. Capitol on January 6th is closing ranks and begging the Army to allow him to continue serving. Private, uh, it was a private first class, right, PFC, uh, uh, Abram Markovsky is set to be sentenced Friday. That's two days from now, right? He faces up to six months in prison and has already agreed to pay a $500 fine for his role in the riot. Oh which did an estimated $1.4 million in damage to the Capitol, by the way. The mob, which Markovsky has admitted to joining, stormed the Capitol, you know why, in an attempt to stop the peaceful transition of power, one of the most perilous moments for democracy in the history of the country that the soldier had sworn an oath to defend. Thank you, military.com. As part of the plea agreement, federal prosecutors are seeking a two-week prison sentence, according to court records. A spokesperson with the Wisconsin Guard... Wisconsin's his state, would not say whether the state is considering giving Markovsky the boot or if he was deployed to Washington, D.C. as part of that state's mission to secure the Capitol following January 6th. Can you believe that? Markovsky's lawyer did not respond to a request for comment ahead of the article's publication, but wouldn't that be something? He storms the Capitol on January 6th. Then they finally clear people out. And as you remember, they posted National Guard troops all over the Capitol just to make sure that it didn't happen again in the days following January 6th. It's possible that somebody was there as a rioter and then deployed to protect the place later on. By the way, I mean, for all the people who said, uh, I think at the time that they said, just one of the many things that they said that uh, AOC was crazy about was her insistence that sometimes it really kind of felt like some of the cops who were guarding the place didn't really have our best interest at heart. It might be more on the side of the mob than anybody else. Well, now it turns out it could be the case that the National Guard troops were too. Markovsky serves in Delta Company, 1st Battalion, 128th Infantry Regiment, a National Guard unit based in River Falls, Wisconsin. He also attended special forces selection in October. How do you like that? Of course, to weed out which soldiers qualify to attempt a career in the Green Berets, but failed the physical fitness test and was swiftly sent home, according to a spokesperson for the Special Warfare Center and School. That's news. Multiple army leaders penned character statements for guard officials and the Department of Justice, saying Markovsky was caught up in the moment and that he should be able to continue his military career. I don't know how I feel about that one. Uh, five, oh, yes, I do. He should not. 
Five soldiers who wrote character references supporting Markovsky, including one officer, four non-commissioned officers, and one junior-ranked soldier who served as Markovsky's team leader, all either did not respond to Military.com's request for comment or said that they were told they were forbidden from communicating with the press. I am fully aware of the severity of PFC Markovsky's actions. I understand that he must be held accountable for his actions. Second Lieutenant Joel Stevenson, Markovsky's platoon leader, said in a letter, My most humble request is that you allow him to continue service. In my professional opinion, as one of his mentors and as a witness to PFC Markovsky's moral character, I truly believe he is an asset to the United States Army. Oh, boy. All right, well, there's more to it. You want to read on? We can't because circumstances dictate this sort of thing. Anyway, I recommend that you read it, but uh, how's that for a twist? Anyway, you might hear more about that in the days to come. Uh, You might hear more about a lot of things in the days to come. Why, I could tell you a little bit about what's coming next when Justice Putnam takes over the mic for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. How about that? Uh, How about the shadowy Utah voter verification project, which is now going door-to-door intimidating citizens while looking for non-existent voter fraud? You knew that was coming. And uh, let's see, citing reduced demand, the EPA lowered the annual production requirements for ethanol and other biofuels. Hmm. There has been lower demand. Uh, People have been trying to stay home and stop giving one another COVID. From NetworksRadio.com, you have been listening to KGRO in the morning with David Waldman. Elsewhere in the government, the Supreme Court is hearing arguments today from parents in Maine who want to use a state tuition program to send their children to religious schools. And Biden's Supreme Court Commission has released its final report. We knew that was coming. Joan told us about it yesterday. Stay tuned for all that and more. We'll be back tomorrow.